Hi, my name is John Cash. I'm the CEO and president of UR Energy. We are a Wyoming-focused in situ uranium producer. We've been producing for over 10 years from our Lost Creek mine, and we're looking at ramping up and building out uh, our mine at Shirley Basin uh, over the next couple of years. It's an exciting time to be in the uranium space. I'm very glad to be ramping up production into that. It is an exciting time. We, we, well, we're taking a little bit of a respite from the sort of spiky uh, uranium price, but we're still in a good place and still a long way to run, right? Yeah, I think so. Uh, the demand continues to grow. The suppliers are not keeping up. So, yeah, we think there's still some room to grow uh, over the next few years. Right, okay. Now, just for new people to this story, give me sort of a, a bit more detail in terms of the, the setup with the, with, the, with the two assets, your cash position, and what you're doing with that cash. Yeah, so our Lost Creek mine is an in situ mine located in south central Wyoming. Uh, we built it out in 2013, uh, or 2012 and 2013, started it in August of 2013. Had some really good exceptional production, very low cost from that mine. Uh, however, post Fukushima and as our market uh, declined and as our sales contracts peeled off, we allowed production to decline. There were no technical problems at all. I get asked about that, but no technical problems. It's just we were running out of contracts. Uh, but, you know, la last year, early last year, the uranium market really began to improve. As it did, we were able to sign up more long-term contracts with major utilities. And as we signed up those contracts, they gave us the faith to go out and start hiring, start drilling, and start ramping production back up. So uh, production is coming along. We've got uh, more header houses in production now. And throughout 2024, we're just going to continue to bring on header houses, bring up the flow rate. Uh, our head grade has been exceptional, and hopefully we continue to see that. And we'll use that production to sell into those contracts. Right. And we have a second flagship property that we uh, talk about uh, in addition to our exploration and other development properties, but that's called Shirley Basin. And that will be our second property that we bring into production. We've not made a go decision on it, but it is completely permitted. So it's ready to build out. I don't need to go any, get any more major government mm -hmm. approvals, but uh, as we're able to layer in more sales contracts and we believe we've got a home for that production, that will be our decision point uh, to build out Shirley Basin and get it into production. Right, and give us a sense of the sort of scale of the, the current operation and what yeah. you hope to be able to get to. So Lost Creek, it's licensed at 1.2 million pounds a year production from the mine itself. Mm -hmm. The processing plant is permitted at 2.2 million pounds per year. And that delta between the two is very intentional. We have always intended to toll process either from one of our other facilities like Shirley Basin or from competitors, and so that's why we, we overbuilt and overlicensed that plant. Right. So last year we did, in 2023, we did a little over 100,000 pounds of production. Uh, going into this year, we would love to get at least 570,000 pounds to fill our contract book. Mm -hmm. And of course, the spot market is very hot, so anything we produce above and beyond that, we would have the opportunity to sell that into the spot market, which today is around $95 a pound. So. We're well, well into the money on those pounds. Talk to us about the difference between tolling and maybe putting together a buying schedule and actually owning. Mm -hmm. why, why, why tolling? So tolling would allow us to bring in pounds from another facility. Mm. And for example, our Shirley Basin mine, mm. we can toll intercompany. Uh, that way we don't have to build out the full Got processing it. plant at Shirley Basin. That'll save us uh, quite a lot of capital yep. because the transportation cost for that distance is minimal right. compared to the capital. So it keeps our cost very low at Shirley Basin. It's a similar story for some of our competitors in the area. We've been approached by numerous uh, microcap uranium uh, juniors that are out there. They've got good exploration projects, but they really don't want to go to the time and cost and effort to permit a full processing plant. So they want, they want agreements in the long term to process at our facility. And for them, it makes a yeah. lot of sense. And as long as we have capacity, it makes sense for us too. It's another source of income. For sure, but I, I want to drill down on a little bit, okay, because I, I get the intercompany inter asset mm -hmm. would make sense on the, on the tolling, right? Um, and, and the margins are, are good because it's short distance, et cetera. But if you're talking to other companies, Rather than the tolling agreement, and, I, and maybe you can help us in terms of the structures, the sorts of structures that you would expect to see there versus just buying buying it outright, owning it, yeah. and processing it. Because the margins, you've got slightly different margins and slightly 
different opportunities. So yeah. can, you, can you give us a... Yeah, you will assess that on a case-by-case -case basis. Sometimes it may make more sense for us to buy that microcap junior and bring those pounds into our story. Uh, we'll look at risk. We'll look at revenue. Uh, you know, all of the business decisions, uh, business factors that you would typically look at before uh, embarking on M&A. And we'll see if oh, that I'm makes sense Oh, I'm not even talking about M&A, John. I'm, I'm talking about, you know, if, if they don't have the processing ability and they're looking for the processing ability, rather than say, hey, can you toll our stuff and we'll... I don't know, you're going to explain in a second what, what, what that agreement could look like versus saying, well, actually, you've got it. You've got it out of the ground. We'll now take it off. We'll buy oh, sure. it off of yes. you, right? Don't need to buy the company. That would be probably yeah. not best use of funds for, for you at the moment. But, you know, own the ore, process the ore, and then yeah. take the upside. So can you give us an insight into sort of the, the, the commercial realities of those different options? Yeah, you know, it depends on the company, what they want to do. Uh, mm. Some companies, they want to market their own pounds. They want to sell it into uh, mm. to the utilities. Uh, but if not, for us to have an offtake agreement where we buy those pounds, it, that makes a lot of sense to us too. Yeah. And that way it gives us the opportunity to market. Yeah. We've got a strong marketing team. We've been able to sign some very good long-term high price contracts. Mm -hmm. And we expect to be able to continue to do that in the future. So yeah, and it, it, that may make more sense to just uh, outright buy those pounds mm -hmm. at the mine mouth versus yeah. toll process for them. It's kind of interesting as well, because you've got a lot of new entrants into the space, especially Wyoming. A yeah. lot of people yes. excited about what's going on in Wyoming and the ability to do business there. But um, so I want to come at it from two angles, kind of commercial and technical, right? So on the, on the commercial uh, side of things, you've, you've got a, a lot of these new companies which, which won't have the processing facilities. They, they couldn't countenance actually raising the funds to, to do that any time soon, right. it, it feels like. You've, you've got that today, it puts you in a strong position for being able to face off against utilities and say, right, let's, let's talk about term contracting here. The guys who don't process or possibly even don't own, or maybe even if they, they, they talk, the margins, the margins is an important thing. Because I think you've got a lot of retail looking in there and going, oh, your aim is at 95 bucks or 100 bucks, 106 bucks, depending on where, you know, yeah. where we are. Mm -hmm. um, they get all of that. They don't get all of that. They get a bit of that. So what, what are they left with? Because I'm trying to do some math about what they're actually worth. What, what, what do the deal structures look like? And, and give me a range, it's fine. Yeah, uh, are you talking about sales prices on, co on contracts? It, it, well, so sales price between you and okay. another company who may want to use your facility to process, yeah. whether it be on tolling or whether it be on a, you know, like a, 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 some kind of buying schedule type agreement. What are they left with? How do I value them? Yeah. So if we sign an agreement where we would buy those pounds at the mine mouth, yeah, that's going to re reduce their revenue by several dollars a pound. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, ultimately that's what we would charge to toll process that. So yeah. it does reduce their valuation overall. But it also reduces a lot of risk. Right. And it also speeds up their ability to get into the market very quickly. They would still need to go through a rigorous permitting process, but they would go through it much more rapidly if they don't have to build out the back end of the processing plant, if they don't have to have radiation safety officers and all of that personnel yeah. that goes along with it. So their advantage is speed to market. Yep. Our advantage is we can pick up those pounds at several dollars a pound cheaper than we would have otherwise. Mm. But again, it really depends on mine site or mill site capacity. Mm. Uh, if we don't have capacity, then we wanna make sure we fill that capacity with our material, yeah. not with the competitors. And, uh, but as long as we've got capacity for that processing, which yeah. we have significant capacity yeah. at Lost Creek, uh, then we would want to go out and uh, fill that capacity as much as we possibly can. Um, but you, having us having access to additional pounds that reduces our risk mm -hmm. because we have other sources of material coming in, yeah. and utilities like that. Uh, utilities sometimes can be a little bit hesitant to uh, buy pounds uh, from a, a company that's maybe only got one project, especially if that project has not proven itself mm. over time. We're glad Lost Creek has proven itself over time, but the more we diversify those pounds coming in, the lower the risk is, mm. and utilities really like that. Okay, so those contracts are really important to those guys, because um, they speed to market in terms of revenue, which, you know, you've got to show a route to market, and, and obviously time is part of that cost basis, but um, I think that's going to be important, important to them. But in terms of the, how I value them, I'm not going to value them as much as I value right. you, because you've, you've kind of got that whole chain secured, that's as it right. were, right? Yeah. Okay, let's, let's make it a little bit more technical now, in, in, in the sense of there are a lot of news stories. There's a lot of white noise out there. I'm trying to work out as an investor, where do I place my bets? Who am I investing in? Because 
you've shown you can get into production, that's fine. So technically, I'm not doubting you. It's now just a question of scaling mm -hmm. and a question of margin. So that's good. So what do are, what are new entrants need to do to get to where you are? Because not all of them will be able to do that. So what are, the, what are the moving parts which are important? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of risk anytime you look at a new entrant into the market. So uh, I get asked this question a lot. Uh, how do you value those? Uh, where are the risks? The risks are numerous, but that's okay. That's, that's a part of the mining story. So if you're going to invest in miners, whether mm. that's uranium, cobalt, nickel, it doesn't matter, gold. Uh, but you know, look at the management team. Mm. Are they proven entities? Maybe not specifically in uranium, but have they proven their ability to take a company and uh, make it successful, mm -hmm. go make discoveries, put projects into production? So they don't necessarily need to have experience within uranium, but that sure does help. Because uranium is such a unique commodity, yeah. there's such a different regulatory regime that a lot of people don't realize until they get into it that, oh my goodness, mm. you mean I have to get this permit and that permit and I need these experts on my team and they don't recognize that. So, But it, just having a good management team, looking at the quality of the projects, that's hard to assess, especially when it's greenfield exploration. Mm. Uh, I mean, you have to have real expertise to really understand, but making sure they're in a good neighborhood where uranium has been found before, preferably where it's being mined, mm. is also very important. And, and just, you know, looking at the uh, capital markets, uh, what are other investors saying about them, sophisticated investors? Have they been able to get financing at reasonable terms? And I think that is always a good reflection on a company if they can. It uh, speaks well of their management and the assets that they hold, right. if they can do that. ISR, known for being quite well, fifty percent of the production globally, yeah. so it's 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 not it, it's it's well known and well understood, right. but by not a lot of people because technically the, it, there is some look if I if, I, if, I, if I'm honest, there's an Australian company in Wyoming has struggled in the past technically to kind of you know, overcome some hurdles. It ISO sounds like quite a simple process. It's not. It's not. It's not. So again, from these new entrants coming in, I'm I'm trying to make sure I don't place my bets on something which is doesn't have the team mm -hmm. that's going to be able to get this across the line technically, because that's just a waste of everyone's time and, and money. So in terms of that ISR component, do you, do you see enough skilled teams out there that are going to be capable of, of coming in no. and delivering? Right. No. Okay. I mean, we've been hiring over right. the last 18 months, trying to uh, regrow some of our technical abilities. You know, we've had a lot of our gray-haired people that are still there to run the company, so we've got that core, but we've needed to grow that team. And yeah, the teams are not out there, so we've hired some exceptionally good people, but we're having to train them now. Right. So entrance into this space, um, it's going to be a, a significant challenge for them mm. to bring on experienced people. Uh, and if they don't already have one or two or three really good experienced people on the team to train, mm -hmm. it's going to be even more difficult. So. I think uh, over the coming next two or three, four years, we're going to see a lot of companies really stub their toes. Right. Not that they're not well-meaning and sure. not that they're not smart. Sure. It's just that they're totally inexperienced using the in-situ technology, which is totally different than conventional mining. See, that's, that's that thing that interests me. So go from the theory of it, so, like I say, a lot of white noise. There's a lot of people who are yeah. heavy on theory, great on a PowerPoint. You've got to translate that into action, operational perfection to be able to optimize, the, well, understand how you go about optimizing the field, uh, field uh, and, and recovery um, pro process. So it's not the case of if, if I've got access to money, I can solve that problem. It's have I got access to people who can technically right. solve that problem for me? Right. That's what you're saying. Yeah, that's exactly right. Let me give you a perfect example of this. Uh, when we do our resource calculations, we use a method called GT contouring okay. because it honors the, the geometry of the ore bodies we work with, which yeah. are very sinuous and narrow. Right. Uh, people who are not experienced in this industry, very often we'll see them use a Krieging method or a block method to estimate resources. Right. And that doesn't work because these resources don't come in large blocks like yeah. you might see with a porphyry copper. Yeah. These are sinuous. I mean, they, sometimes these are 10, 15, 20 feet wide and they look like a pile of spaghetti yeah. when you do the resource maps. So the Krieging or the block models just don't work. Yeah. Yeah. So they'll take a resource and very often we see that they double or triple the pounds that are actually there. Right. And so they, they're making these assumptions, I've got X million pounds that supports a go decision to build it out. They yeah. build out, they put it into production, and they don't get the pounds out of the ground that they thought they were going to get. 
So maybe they've put $100 million into the project and it's not economic because the pounds aren't there. That's fascinating. We, we see that in gold a lot. When, when you know, people are chasing like, you know, high grade, thin, mm -hmm. narrow veins, exactly. and they kind of do that, that block modeling as well. And it's like, well, that, this block is not going to be the same as that block that's as right. it swells and pinches. That's a perfect analogy. Yeah, it's, 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 it's really, really interesting. So that's fascinating. So um, can we talk about the U.S.? You're in, you're in the U.S. I just kind of want a sort of sense of, you know, how it, it feels out there at the moment. Like I say, we're taking a little, little pause in, in the price, which people get excited about. But the reality is it's about term contracts, right? right. You, you described some scenarios at the beginning where, you know, you, you had contracts and then they kind of petered out. Now it's time to kind of ramp up again. U.S. utilities, they're paying attention now, aren't they? They are. The price is getting, it's way, we're way past incentive price, isn't it? It is, absolutely. No, we are well into the money, even on all-in basis, covering corporate overhead, taxes, royalties, and all of that. We're, yeah. we're well in the money on our contracts, right. and certainly the uh, long-term price and the spot price are well above that incentive price. I, I see, I, which is fascinating. But that's the conversation I've been most interested in in the last two years. People talk about incentive pricing. So mm -hmm. it's going to be slightly different things to different people, for, for sure. But it's almost like a defense mechanism to stop them having to get into production. Because that's the proof point, right? right. Show me. Don't tell that's, me, show me. That's right. And I think it's show me time, right? It is. It absolutely is. You know, the, the range of uh, incentive prices in the U.S. for in situ uh, probably range uh, from $55 to maybe $100 in that range, depending mm. on the quality of the project. And certainly we're on that lower end of the spectrum. Yeah. Uh, we've been incentivized. We've got those long-term contracts. Right. Um, How many are you uh, sitting on? We've got three right now. Uh -huh. We are in some uh, discussions with uh, utilities for more. And I think in the very near term, we'll be signing up some additional long-term sales contracts. And those will give us... I think uh, the line of sight to bring Shirley Basin into production, but we want to make sure we've got a home for those pounds right. before we produce them. So, you know, maybe we'll go 20, 30, maybe as much as 40% okay. um, unhedged, but uh, we want to make sure we lock in revenues in the long term. A lot of people don't realize the spot market, uh, it can be exciting. That's what a lot of people watch, but it is not the market. Yeah. The market is the term price, the long term price. And that's the world we live in because we want to lock in those long-term safe revenues for the company. But uh, some companies are willing to go out there and uh, be unhedged and say, hey, we'll ramp up when the market's hot and we'll slow down when it's not. Um, but it's challenging to do that. It's, it's a complicated space. Mm. The barriers to entry are incredibly high. We talked about skill. Mm. The skill's not out there right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, drill rigs, supply chain, so, you know, we've been uh, ramping up production now for a year, and I can tell you it's really difficult. We're getting there. We've been successful. Mm -hmm. uh, but for a lot of other parties that want to be unhedged and try to enjoy the spot, it's dangerous. Well, tell Powers and Mark won that, right? You know, yeah. they, they, that was their undoing in, in, in the end. Um, that was another time, and, and another business decision, and people have learned from that, one, one hopes. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms, in terms of the, what utilities is looking for, because again, this is fantastic, because it gives me a sort of insight into you know, how hard it is to actually get into production, yeah. and how hard it is to make sure it's an economic success, because margin is everything, uh, and, and de-risking is everything in that economic environment, right? So if I'm looking at utilities now, how do they engage with you? I, I, do they start off and say, well, let's give you a little bit now, and we'll give you a little bit more later, right. and then it, 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 it build up, or are they so desperate they're going to well, give us everything you've got? I mean, is that, is that a conversation that's ever going to happen? So they're not that desperate yet, mm. uh, but we are getting increasing uh, volume of uh, interest mm. in calls and RFPs. But no, we, de we continue to develop relationships with all of the utilities in the U.S. and in Europe. We meet with them several times a year and sit down and talk, mm -hmm. uh, give them updates on our projects. They give us updates on their needs going forward. Mm -hmm. And then as they have needs, they will put out a request for proposal. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, uh, they prefer to buy uh, safe pounds from projects right. that are proven, from companies that are proven. Uh, utilities are risk adverse. And so they want that security, and they, they want diversity. Mm -hmm. For many years, uh, the nuclear utilities were financially struggling, and that's not the case anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so in those years where they were struggling, they would lean more into the cheapest pounds, right. not the diversity. 
mm. uh, because they didn't have the luxury of the diversity. But now that they're more economic, they are mm. looking for more and more diverse supplies. Uh, U.S. supplies, North American supplies out of Canada. Uh, I'm sure Cameco is getting a lot of calls for that reason, more than normal because of that reason. Certainly we are. Uh, but just safe jurisdictions. They're wanting to move away from uh, more Eastern aligned yeah. supplies. Yeah. Not that they can move totally away, Not yet. but if they can diversify some, they are yeah. certainly looking to do that. And so that's giving us a lot of opportunity and we're getting so many calls. Uh, but they're not going to put all their eggs in one basket. Even in the North America or with us, they still want that to be spread out uh, around the globe. Um, diversity is safety. Diversity is safety, but it, I'm looking at the globe. Right? Look at Niger. The coup did not help matters. Throwing the French out did not help matters. Um, I guess Namibia would be the next place you want, one would look with in terms of large, low-grade uh, production. Canada, I'm looking at and going, well, Again, it's, it, I, I want to go show, not tell, a uh, conversation with a lot of, a lot of people up, up there. And when, and if and when that, that supply you know, hits the market, it's a long time out, I think that's fair to say. The US, lots of small US stories, talking about getting into, I think energy feels like popped into mm -hmm. production as well. And right. I think Peninsula hopes to see. Yeah. Um, Encore is uh, getting there. Absolutely, Bill Sting is thing. And, but it's not a lot, not a whole bunch right. of beans, as they say. That's right. <laughs> right? What's going to give this year if we, if we can't get that line of sight to, you know, Cameco's had some issues, Rana's right. got a bunch of issues, Kazakhstan seems to be everything's heading east, it, it feels like, and, and talk of Mongolia, I think, is, is perhaps a little bit ahead little, of the Yeah, curve it's further out. Bit. Yeah. It's further out. Uh, what, what are we, what's going to happen out there? No, we think that we're going to continue to see price pressure. Uh, ultimately, the miners will catch up. I mean, supply-demand fundamentals. It doesn't mm. matter what commodity we talk about. So it boils back down to those uh, supply-demand fundamentals. So the miners will catch up, but it's mm. not going to be this year or next year. Mm -hmm. Maybe three years, four years from now, the miners begin to catch up. But that gap between supply and demand, it's exacerbated by reactors coming online, mm. in particular in China. Uh, they're building about 10 reactors a year and bringing those online. So the miners have not got to catch up just to that baseline amount. There's more reactors coming online yeah. to feed into. And so we expect to see in the long run, now I'm not talking about the near term or the, the uh, intermediate term, you know, next three or four years, but in the longer term, we expect to see the price of uranium continue to uh, go up uh, faster than inflation right? because there's more and more demand. And you know we can talk about small modular reactors. It's exciting. Uh, I'm a bit of a technology wonk when it comes to, to nuclear fission, and mm. I enjoy talking about those things. But we have to be realistic too. It's a few yeah. years out, yep. uh, five years, eight years out before we yeah. really begin to see demand from those. Yeah. But in that long term, in a tight market, that just is more pressure on the market going forward. Right, okay. How does a company like you take advantage of a situation like this? Because when we've talked in the past, you've been very, careful and conservative about allocation of capital and not saying, well, oh, we're going to ramp up and, you know, market leader, M&A, all of that kind yeah. of good stuff that people like to, like to put in headlines. As a you know, careful arbiter of, of the company's cash, you've, still got, you've got to still think positively about, well, how do I, what's the best route now for this company, given the, the, right. the backdrop we've just described globally, not just in terms of the demand, but the short-term supply gap, which is inevitably heading this way. Yeah. You know, we're recognized as a conservative company. Our previous CEO, myself, our board, we're a value play. That's our objective, and that's what we want to continue to be. We've had a lot of opportunity on the M&A front to go out and make acquisition of projects that would probably be break-evens of, you know, 85, 90, maybe some of them even $100 a pound. Yeah. They're not in the market today despite a hot market. Yeah. So we're not that interested in that. We are interested in growing the company through greenfield work mm -hmm. of our own assets, mm -hmm. especially at Lost Creek. We have a lot of room to grow there. But if we're going to jump into the M&A world, it's going to have to be quality assets. Right. So we're going to continue to be very disciplined, very conservative. We are looking to grow production, but not at any cost. We're running a business. Hmm. And so the decisions we make, they're going to be based on the bottom line is can we make money on these projects going forward uh, or in the foreseeable future? 
And uh, if the answer is no, based on a realistic technical and economic review, then the answer is it's not for us. We'll leave it to others to, to play that game. Mm. Uh, but no, we're, we're wanting to mine economic pounds and make money in the long-term market. And that's how we intend to continue to play it. And I think that's the expectation of our shareholders. Mm. That's why they hold us. Good, Good to see you. All right. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it.